from the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope that you are sheltering in place in a comfortable environment, and we look forward to greeting you back in our Yacht Club just as soon as conditions permit. So sailors and powerboaters alike usually get excited when they see a whale in their path. I remember a Friday night race a couple of years ago when my youngest daughter, Christina, who just got her master's degree, she got all excited during a Friday night race. She said, dad, dad, right in front of us, right in front of us, there's a whale. And sure enough, about two lengths right in front of us, a 50 foot whale surfaced and dove and spouted. I want everybody to pay attention to the race, but we all stopped to take a look at the whales. Well, our speaker today got into his field doing just such a thing as a young boy. The first boat he ever got on was a whale watching boat on a tour when he was a seven year old. He would go on to get a BS in environmental sciences from Cornell and then go on to get a PhD at Davis in ecology. So we get to hear today from a young boy who starts out watching whales and now is informing the world all about the science of whales, what whales eat, how much they eat, and how they represent an incredibly sizable chunk of the ecosystem in the sea. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, Matt Savoka. Thanks so much, Ron. It's awesome to be here. Um, I love talking with groups of uh, enthusiastic folks about ocean conservation and marine animals and the cool planet that we live on currently and what we can do to conserve it. So I'm really excited to be here today and uh, let me share my screen so we could get talking about whales. Today I'll be talking primarily about how much whales eat, but that's just kind of a lead in to, to the real thing that I want to talk about, which is why whales matter and specifically why we need a world with whales. And so hopefully by the end of my talk, I will have at least somewhat convinced you of that. And then I think Ron and I will have a discussion uh, and we'll be able to sort of chat some more. But uh, of note here, uh, please, if you feel like you want to contact me about any of the material in this talk to learn more or to reach out to see what our next steps are uh, or how you might participate, uh, that's my email right there, uh, that Gmail link there. So, so please do get in touch. Love talking with folks about this work and happy to do so with any of you as well. So Matt, after the talk, if people want to uh, come down to uh, Pacific Grove, which is a beautiful place to visit anyway, yep. and um, go out on a whale watching tour, uh, can we organize a thing like that? I think that'd be really fun. When I was a kid, um, my, the, you know, like my, my elementary school yearbook, the first thing I said I wanted to be was a wildlife photographer. And then one of the second things I said I wanted to be <clears throat> was like a tour guide for like eco tours sort of thing. So this would be, you know, like childhood kind of dreams and stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, let's let's uh, let's try to schedule that, Ron. If people are interested, uh, be happy to show you around the Marine Station and the amazing, amazing wildlife that we have here in Monterey Pacific Grove. Anyway, we'll talk about the different ways in which whales eat, and we'll talk about how we sort of how we study that and what that means. And so. Yeah, I mean, we could absolutely talk about that. My last slide, as you'll see, is a picture of that from the air, an aerial drone photo of of that of that. Um, Wonderful. It's yeah, it's pretty spectacular to be able to work with these um, animals that are really, really dynamic underwater. They're like underwater, you know, ballerinas or something. They're they're incredibly, incredibly agile and nimble underwater. So you might see them when they're at the surface, like the story you mentioned. And they kind of seem lumbering and slow, perhaps, but they are very nimble underwater. It's it's impressive to see on the cameras, and I'll show you some of that. And they work in teams from, I know, from our previous talk. So I'm, I'm anxious to hear all about this. This is great. Yeah, so so uh, we're going to talk about uh, how much whales eat, how we figure that out, and why it matters, uh, not just to ocean ecosystems, but to us, to people as well. So um, yeah, so I just wanted to orient folks to uh, whales in general, the world of whales, and you'll notice here that there's a lot of dolphins on this picture here. And the point is that all dolphins are whales, but not all whales are dolphins. So all of the whales face on the right side of the, the diagram facing to the left are toothed whales. These are things like dolphins, like killer whale, which is the largest dolphin, uh, like sperm whale, animals you might have heard of. But those are all whales. There's many of them. However, the whales that I'll be focusing on today are what's known as the baleen whales. And those are the whales on the left side of this diagram and they're facing to the right. 
And specifically, the whales I'll be talking about today, I wanted to highlight and point out to you, are the blue whale, which is the largest animal to ever live on Earth, and largest by a, by a huge margin, particularly if you consider their weight. So in terms of their length, they can grow up to about 80 to 90 and occasionally 100 feet long, which challenges and is about equivalent to the largest dinosaurs in terms of length. However, if you look at the mass or the weight of these animals, these large whales are much, much heavier, so therefore much larger um, than any dinosaur ever. So these, the largest blue whales could weigh up to 150 tons, um, you might be able to relate that to a size of a, a certain boats that you all know about. Um, but the largest dinosaur is about 70 tons. So these blue whales are about twice the weight of the largest dinosaur. Uh, so they are massive, massive animals. And we have them right here in California, actually. I think California is one of, if not the best places in the world to see blue whale. And Monterey actually is a great place to see a blue whale in the late summer or early fall. Uh, the next whale we'll be talking about is the fin whale. That's the second largest whale um, in, on Earth, uh, second largest animal to ever live. And a nickname for this whale is the greyhound of the sea because they're really fast. Um, they are quite nimble uh, underwater. And uh, yeah, they're really just spectacular animals. Uh, the smallest whale in our group, uh, which is the Antarctic minke whale. So these, these are among the smallest of the baleen whales. Uh, and just for scale, by the way, uh, here's a little silhouette of a diver. So you can still see that even the smallest whale that I'll be talking about today is still many times bigger than a human and is about twice the weight of an elephant. So even the smallest whale we'll talk about is, is still massive by, by animal standards. And that's the Antarctic minke whale. The final one in the group that we'll talk about uh, is the humpback whale. This is really the acrobat of the group. Um, in particular, the ones that, that we see, humans see, doing acrobatics, because they love to breach, jump out of the water. They sometimes lunge feed by rushing out of the water. They'll slap their pectoral fins around. Um, they'll slap their tail fins around. They very often send their fluke out of the water when they dive. Um, and I mean, it's, it's amazing to see. And humpback whales are, are quite common. They've rebounded really, really well after, after whaling. And we'll talk about that later. They've, re they've rebounded really, really well. Um, and just to see them in our oceans is quite spectacular. They're the size of a school bus, so they're, they're a very significantly sized animal. And actually, I remember growing up in New York City, um, the waters were so polluted, you'd never dream of seeing a whale. But now, uh, about 50 years or so, 40, 50 years after the Clean Water Act and similar environmental regulations of the 1970s, uh, the waters around New York City are so well cleaned that you can actually see humpback whales with the New York City skyline in the background. And this is a dream that, you know, I never thought was going to be possible in my lifetime. But what it shows us is that we have the capability to restore the planet, to restore the damage that we've done. And that's actually where I'll end this talk today um, in a little bit. But again, it's just been spectacular to see the recovery of humpback whales in the last half, in the last 50 years or so. Humpback whales have been doing incredibly, incredibly well which we can't say for a lot of these other whales. So give us some metrics when you say they're recovering from what to what? The, the best numbers that mm -hmm. I'm aware of, just to talk about numbers, would be numbers from the Southern Ocean because that's where the best whaling numbers were kept. Um, and that's where the best population information was kept because we, you know, by the time we started hunting whales near Antarctica, it was more of modern times. And so we had a better idea for how many whales we were killing, how many whales were out there and so on. So humpback whales went from, uh, maybe a couple hundred thousand animals to about 400 animals in a really short period of time. Uh, so depleted by something like 98%. Um, from what year to what year? So the numbers sh uh, shrunk from about one or 200,000 animals in 1910 to about 500 animals in 1960 or 1970. So a dramatic reduction, uh, about 98% of the population was, was exterminated in about 50 or 60 years, which is about as long as these whales live. So in one whale's lifetime, uh, we killed 98% of these humpback whales, um, but they've recovered quite well. And that is in contrast to, uh, to blue whales or fin whales that have not recovered, uh, particularly blue whales have not recovered well around Antarctica. And we'll talk about uh, why that might be a little later on. But anyway, so I wanted to orient you to some of the spectacular stuff we get to see here in Monterey, and you can consider this a plug for why you should come visit 
Monterey and Pacific Grove. But basically, uh, to orient yourself to this picture here, there's the, uh, the whale watching boat, the black fin uh, in the top part of the frame there. Uh, that's a 65 foot catamaran whale watching vessel. And I was lucky enough to actually be on it this day. I'm in the top deck there. You can't really see me, but believe me, I'm there because I'll never forget this. We had a blue whale that was actually feeding at the surface this day. Usually they feed at depth. So to be able to see an 80 foot, 85 foot whale feeding at the surface was truly spectacular. And uh, we have some footage of that here. So as you'll see, what these whales do is they rush forward and they take an enormous, enormous mouthful of krill. And then they spend about a minute uh, filtering, pushing the water uh, from that mouthful, pushing the water out through their baleen plates. You can see that happening now, um, retaining just the krill and swallowing that krill down. And they do this again and again when they're feeding. They'll feed all day like this. Uh, and we'll show you some data of what the data looks like from our tags that we put on whales um, when they're feeding all day like that. So yeah, this is um, a spectacular thing to be able to get to see on a fairly, uh, well, on a, it's pretty rare to see them feeding at the surface like this, but we do get to see whales quite commonly uh, in Monterey. So it's a really cool, cool place to be for this. One of the questions that I started working on uh, early when I got in my postdoctoral position here at the Hopkins Marine Station uh, was to try to figure out how much food the large whales eat. And we were interested in that for a number of different reasons, for reasons of ecosystem management. I was interested in it for pollution reasons. So I studied plastic pollution in the ocean. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to do was come up with an estimate for how at risk these large filter feeding animals are to plastic pollution. And the way to actually come up with an estimate for that is we need to know how much food they're eating and how much water they're filtering. And so I figured that we actually had, and by we, I mean the scientific community, had actually worked out how much these large whales ate because you know how could we not know how much a blue whale eats, right? Um, but in fact, we actually hadn't for the most part. For the most part, the way we figured out how much whales eat was through a technique called metabolic extrapolation. And what that is in simple terms is basically, um, so for an example, an animal like a human, we can put on fancy equipment. If you've ever done one of these um, sort of uh, physiological tests where they put a, a face mask on you and then you run on a treadmill and you see how much energy you're burning, you can convert that back into how much fuel or food you need to actually fuel your body, right? And so the extrapolation part uh, is to say, okay, if a human needs this much food, then an animal the size of a blue whale needs this much food. But it's never been measured in a whale before. It's certainly never been measured in a living whale before. So I was surprised to know that this was a huge open area of research that we didn't actually know how much whales eat. We never measured it, it's kind of crazy. But the estimates for how much they ate based on all these previous measures was about two to 5% of their body weight per day. And for reference, uh, human beings eat about 5% of our body weight per day. And this is gonna be important when you think about whales ecology, right? So whales, baleen whales um, is what I'm talking about here. They don't eat half the year, right? So they only eat about three, four, five months of the year and not every single day during those uh, five months or so. And when they're breeding down near the tropics, they're not eating at all almost. Sometimes they'll eat here and there, but they don't really eat down there. So this is a warm blooded animal like me and you um, that has high sort of baseline costs of just being alive. They're not like a snake that can just sit in a leaf litter pile uh, or a lizard that can just sit in the cold for a month and not move. Um, they're also not like a bear, they don't hibernate. So these whales are really spectacular in a lot of ways. And I'm gonna try to hit on where they are truly spectacular. And one of the places in which they're truly spectacular is their feeding and metabolic physiology it is really amazing. Um, unlike uh, people, they don't eat for most of the year, but just like people, they're warm blooded. They have very high baseline metabolic costs of just staying alive. Um, and so it is truly remarkable that animals this size, warm blooded animals of this size that don't hibernate can just not eat for two thirds of the year and survive, reproduce, migrate. They migrate thousands of miles every single year and they do that without eating for half the year. It's, it's remarkable when you think about it, how these animals live. But in any case, previous estimates, the best guess from these metabolic models 
were that these whales ate somewhere between two and 5% of their body weight per day. So you said the biggest whales are 150 tons. So we're gonna say that's 300,000 pounds. And you said they can eat up to 5% of their body weight per day when they're feeding. Yep. So 5% of 300,000 is 100, and, let's see, would that be about 15,000 pounds of food per day in feeding season? If I got that right? Yeah, so that would be the absolute largest. So if you look at like the range of possible estimates, that would be at like the tippy top of the guess. Do you know what I'm saying? So that's not the, av that would be like, yeah, that would be like the absolute top, but keep that number in mind. You should definitely keep that number in mind because we're going to come back to it. 15,000 pounds of food a day, man, a lot. Okay. Just to, just to give us the number. It is a lot of food. And uh, we're going to get back to uh, where we think our numbers improve on that and even make those numbers larger um, okay. than they were. So a truly spectacular amount of food these animals eat almost no matter which estimates you use, the past estimates or these current estimates, which we'll talk about. It's a huge amount of food. Most of these estimates have been done using metabolic measurements from other animals, things like cats or rats or humans and extrapolating it up to the size of a whale. However, we did actually measure how much food whales eat in some regard. And uh, that was this way. So this is part of our intimate history uh, with whales. Uh, we can't really talk about whales, particularly their conservation, without talking about whaling. So this is uh, the Sa uh, South Georgia Whaling Station in the 1920s, and there is a massive blue whale here. Actually, a couple of them. You can see one that's been uh, flensed is the word. They've already taken, stripped the blubber off this whale on the right, uh, on the left here, sorry. And then this main blue whale here in the figure here, uh, they've just hauled this one up on shore, and they're about to cut this uh, stem to stern, the, 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 the blubber off this whale, melt it down, and will come, become products like car oil, margarine, and so on. Um, so hundreds of thousands, about a million or more large whales were taken in this manner in the Southern Ocean uh, within the last hundred years. So really, really recent um, kind of an horrific story of what happened to whales in the oceans. Um, but uh, for the purposes of this talk, another way in which we guessed how much whales ate was by opening up the stomachs and measuring the contents of the stomachs of these dead whales. But as you might imagine, if you were doing this for a human, for example, it's hard to kind of guess how much we eat in a day based off of how much is in our stomach at any one time. So the point here being that these measurements, no matter how they were done in the past, were imperfect. Um, and, you know, I think the key issue is that they'd never been done on living whales. So we never actually measured how much a living whale is eating because the technology didn't allow for it. But now uh, with uh, our improving technology, we're able to actually do that. And so this is kind of a little graphic representation of what our project has done. So the first thing we did was we attached uh, tags to the surface of whales here. This is us deploying a tag on a blue whale out in Monterey Bay in the top left here. Um, then those tags record feeding behavior, and I'll show you specifically how in a little bit um, that here. And so with these tags that kind of act like a Fitbit, you can tell how many gulps of water these whales take per hour, per day, something along those lines, right? How big are these tags that you stick on the whale? About this, like if you imagine a football, it's like a football yeah. cut in half. So the tags that we use primarily are suction cup attached. Isn't that cool? So they are non-invasive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, it's a little bit of a disturbance to the whales to get up alongside them, but we don't actually attach anything sort of subdermally um, in the whales for our research. We work with collaborators that do, and for certain questions, that's absolutely essential to do. But for most of our work, it's just suction cup tags, which is, uh, which is pretty exciting. After we put the tag on the whale, we then measure the whale using a drone from the sky. And that's important because it helps us get the, the volume of that mouth. And so you need to know that if you want to know how much prey and how much water are going in. And the last really important bit of information we, we use is we attach what's called echo sounders um, for you boating folks. That I, these are fish finders, fancy fish finders um, to the back of these Zodiac type vessels. And they send pulses of sound into the water column. And we listen or the instrument listens to the returning echoes and we get an idea of the prey density. So how much food there is per unit volume in that water beneath us that the whales are feeding on. And by combining these three things together, we're able to get the first, really, the first measurements from living whales as to how much food they're consuming. 
So that's that's pretty exciting to put all these pieces together. And that's largely what I've been working on for the last couple of years. Just to give you a little idea of what this looks like in the bottom left here, you can see us attaching. This is our my lab mate, Dave. He's attaching a, a suction cup tag on a blue well. That video will run and repeat. So I'll just leave that on as I, wow. as I talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have this pulpit attached to a, to a Zodiac boat there. We get up alongside it. I think the probably the hardest job is the driver. That That's a really skilled job to be able to drive up alongside a blue whale like that. You, you can't just do that. It's very, very- um, Are you sticking very, that green and you're saying it's got a suction cup holding it on. Exactly. You can kind it's of see wireless. that here in the bottom right. Uh -huh. You can see what the tag might look like. Uh, these suction cups hold onto it here. Yeah. And again, you know, uh, come to Monterey. We'll we'll schedule a uh, hopefully a tour of Hopkins for for your for your uh, for your yacht club members if anyone wants, and uh, we could do a tour and, and you can all hold these and see what these tags look like in life, um, uh, which could be really fun. So I like to call these tags uh, whale iPhones um, because all the same sensors that you have in your iPhone are in this tag, except the difference is this tag can be strapped to the back of a whale and go several hundred meters underwater. Your iPhone can't do that. <laughs> But basically uh, here you see, uh, here's our, our GPS sensor and our light sensor. Um, here's the front facing camera. This tag actually has a back facing camera. Not all of our tags have that. And then inside, you can't really see this, but inside there's this data board, much like a computer or your phone. And that houses the accelerometer, the magnetometer, the gyrometer, things like that. And so by combining all of these data streams together, we get an incredibly rich and vivid picture of what these whales are doing underwater. Um, and again, really only technology that's been developed in the last 10 or 20 years has enabled us to do this. So we couldn't have even done this project uh, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. You could really only have done this project in the last 10 or 20 years. So it's been exciting to be on this technology, you know, the, the upper end of this technology revolution as we can actually ask these questions of these amazing animals. Um, how often do these sensors fall off? And how often are they bitten off by another animal? They're never bitten off. Um, they, they're meant to fall off, right? So that's how they come off. They, they, they come off naturally, um, uh, usually after about five to 20 hours, roughly speaking. So they're on for like half a day. And when they're on, they collect data at a rate of between, depending on the sensor, between five to 10 or 400 times a second. So we're talking about so much data that the short amount of time that the tag is on is not a big problem for us because we are dealing with an incredible amount of data from a tag that's on for really only a short period of time. And I'll show you exactly what that looks like now. So this is um, a video from one of our tags. Uh, on the bottom here, you see some of this, some of the data, and we can talk through this if you'd like. But you know, the real action here is of course happening in the video for you all. But basically this is a blue whale feeding in Monterey Bay. Um, and sometimes these whales, as we talk about, forage cooperatively. Uh, and this blue whale is actually going to film its buddy feeding in a really spectacular fashion. So uh, both of these whales are going to rush forward simultaneously. They're doing that now. And so you'll see this whale film its friend as it does a pirouette and takes an enormous gulp of krill right above the, the main animal there. Um, and you can actually see the krill that survived kind of flying past the camera here. <laughs> right. Amazing. Um, yeah, and so uh, we have lots and lots of footage like this. Uh, it's pretty awesome. But yeah, I mean, so so to show the videos to to folks like your group is really exciting because that's that's what you know people love to see. But we care more about, of course, this data here at the bottom. These these data streams down here are able to tell us what the whale is doing even when the camera isn't working, and that happens often if the if the whale is too deep and there's not enough light. Sometimes the camera just doesn't work. A lot of different issues can occur, but in any case, we always have this data working, which is great because it tells us about what the whale is doing, even if the camera is not working at that given time. So by doing this, we can get an, exam an idea and understanding of what that animal is doing underwater. And so this is an example of what that data looks like when you plot it out over the course of one tag deployment. So this is a tag deployment on a blue whale from 2011 in Southern California. And what you see here on the uh, y-axis is the depth of that whale. And on the x-axis is actually time. So the amount, so the time that that, that that tag was on the animal. And these red dots here we've highlighted are the different times in that tag deployment where the whale takes a large mouthful of food. 
right? So each one of those is a gulp. And another cool thing that you notice here is as day turns to twilight, turns to night, the whale is foraging shallower and shallower in the water column. And why is that? It's because their prey actually migrates up to the surface at night. And so they follow their prey as it comes up to the surface at night. Uh, and then at night, actually, the prey is often not dense enough to feed on. So the whales mostly hang out at that time. We find them doing a lot of calling and socializing behavior at that time, uh, but they're often not feeding at night. Not always true, but often not feeding at night. But in any case, what you'll notice, and, and this is one of the things that we noticed early on, was that they, they do so much feeding. On days in which they're feeding, they are feeding nonstop. And this is something that previous researchers who didn't have access to this technology, and I'm talking about researchers of decades or even a century ago, I'm not talking about researchers of a couple of years ago, but before this technology existed, they had no idea that these whales were feeding literally all day long. Um, and to give you a better example of that, these are some collaborators we work closely with. This is John Callenbakitis and James Falbush. Uh, James is actually a PhD student in, in the lab and John Callenbakitis uh, runs the Cascadia Research Collective, which studies whales off the Pacific coast of the US for about 40 years now. But they use a different style of tag that actually does implant in the skin and so can stay on for days or weeks at a time. So this is an example of a tag that was on for 18 days on a blue whale um, in, in 2017. And what you see in the top panel here is again, depth is on the Y and time is on the X, except now we're looking over the course of 18 days. So, and e again, each one of these red dots is a feeding lunge. So you can see they are feeding when on days in which they're feeding, they are feeding all day long, only stopping to breathe and they'll stop to rest at night. But even on some nights, like you see this day here, they're feeding even at night uh, occasionally, which is really spectacular because that means that from here to here, they're feeding for something like 36 hours straight. And this feeding behavior is very energetically intensive. The way I like to describe it to people is imagine eating a buffet while running a marathon. That's what these animals are doing. Now, imagine eating a buffet while running three marathons nonstop. That's what these whales are doing every day they're feeding. I mean, it is absolutely remarkable. So let's look at these two charts. The chart above, the dark spot is nighttime or dark time. Yeah. Is that right? And then the daytime is the white vertical columns. And so they're feeding mostly in the daytime and they feed lower, lower, lower in the daytime where light gets down lower. And then at nighttime, we see it goes up and they're feeding way up the top. And then down below, the lower chart shows the number of lunges per over time. Is that what's just going on here? The yeah, this is, just, this is just the number of lunges that they do per dive. So how many lunges they do per, um, yeah, per, per dive, basically. So, so each one of their dives, they're doing something like five lunges before they have to come back up and breathe again. But I think for our purposes, this top panel is more interesting. Just okay. looks at all these different days. And again, it shows that on days in which they're feeding, they are feeding all day long. So they're they're feeding at 450 feet down. Yeah, yeah that's about right. Yep. So that's very deep. The deepest part of San Francisco Bay is in the Golden Gate entrance where it drops to 330 just north of the South Tower. Uh, but most of San Francisco Bay is only like, you know, 50 feet, 60 feet, 40 feet, 30 feet, depends upon where in the bay. But Central Bay, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 feet. When they come into San Francisco Bay, um, that's lower, that's shallower than the average feeding in this particular set of diagrams. Yes, uh, exactly. Well, there's a couple of important differences there. One is that when you get whales coming into San Francisco Bay, it's almost always going to be a humpback whale. Um, and they can feed on, sh on shallow fish. They can feed on fish at the surface. Uh, the this is a diagram of a blue whale. They only eat krill, and krill tends to hang out deeper in the water column during the day. So you would it would be very unusual, very, very unusual to see a blue whale in San Francisco Bay, like almost like exceptional. I don't know if there's any record of it. Um, but humpback whales do come into San Francisco Bay. We'll get back to this core question here uh, that we're trying to answer, which is how how do you put all these pieces together to figure out how much these whales eat in a given day. And so the one last component that we haven't talked about is to actually measure that prey field. How do we measure how much food is in the water column? And so the way this is typically done is on these large oceanographic research vessels. Here's a NOAA ship called the Bell Shimada. 
And they can come up with these ecosystem scale. They do these large transects of the ocean and they get these huge, huge um, uh, sort of quadrants of how much krill is in a giant area of ocean. And that's not really relevant to a foraging whale. That's not what a whale is gonna eat on. It's, it's, it's example to think about would be if you're trying to measure how much food a human eats and you measure how much food is in a grocery store, that doesn't really, that doesn't really make sense. So we have this issue of scale here. So what we've done, uh, led by Dave Cade in our lab, he's a postdoctoral researcher now, he finished his PhD in 2019. Um, what he did was he is focusing on these smaller patches of krill, which by the way, are still vast patches of food. Um, but these are the patches of food that whales are interested in. So in this diagram here, you have a sort of a transect of Monterey Bay. And in that transect here, you see what the, what the echo sounder would see here. This is the fish finder now. Exactly. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. And so, so here I've highlighted uh, these patches of food right there. And so these are three pretty nice krill patches in the water column. This is what a blue whale will be looking for. And you notice the scale of these patches is on the scale of a couple hundred meters in three dimensions. So enormous, like several times the size of a football field, but not on the scale of this is these, these uh, quadrants are 10 by 10 kilometers. So just a way different scale. Um, but this is what the whales are actually feeding on. And so the point is, if you averaged out the prey across this entire, uh, this entire range of ocean, you'd come up with a very low number, but that's not relevant to the whale. The whale is eating these really hyper dense patches of food in the water column. Explain the red table, uh, red to gray table on the right there, that scale, please. This here, yeah. So this, this here is, and again, you, you all probably know this from your, from your uh, boating work, but basically, um, as colors get redder uh, to brown on this scale, those are denser. That's that's how densely packed those those uh, krill are in this diagram. And this the scale that it actually measures in is these are like returning echoes from the actual uh, from the echo sounder. That's what does it mean? Minus thirty five or dash thirty five seventy five? Tell us what those mean. Yeah, so so those are the returned echoes in uh, decibels received. Uh, basically. So the, these, these sound devices put uh, sound waves into the water at a certain uh, frequency and power, and then it listens to those returned echoes and the frequency and power of those returned echoes, and it converts them into this uh, decibel per, per meter metric, basically. So how the rate of sound returned per unit time kind of is a way to think about it. So this is measuring lots of density. The brown is very, very dense krill, and the gray is less dense krill. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So the white, there's no krill. And then, then the red here, there are these dense, dense parts of krill. And then these are intermediate down over here, you see. So, okay. yeah. So the whale's interested in hitting those red parts, right? And they're pretty efficient at doing so. But how do we measure them is we go out on small boats, the same small boats we do our tagging on in many cases. And we use those uh, echo sounders to uh, measure the density of those prey swarms. And when we put all those pieces together, what we're able to do is come up with information like this. So these are from all of our tags from all over the world. Um, and I'm gonna try to walk you through this diagram here. How so many tags? Over 300 tag deployments uh, in the, over the last decade. And we're still doing it, right? So this is stuff that will be improved upon uh, in the coming years, but this is our first sort of big picture take of all of our data that we have to date. And the 300 tags are your tags, or are they counting the ones that uh, other people are putting on as well? They're mostly from, well, when I say our tags, I mean, my boss, Jeremy Goldbogen, and his collaborators at um, U University of California, Santa Cruz, um, you know, and other play uh, Cascadia Research Collective that I mentioned earlier, and others, uh, we all work together. And I should have also mentioned that we get all these tags back. So these tags are all recoverable, and we get them all back. We have like a 98% recovery rate. So we almost always get the tags back. So it's not like we've put out 300 tags and we're losing all those tags. We get them all back. So when you put together all these different components, what you get is how much prey these animals are eating per day. And so on the uh, y-axis here, this is an amount of prey consumed in tons per individual per feeding day. That's what this is here. And then uh, these are the different species. So this is a blue whale in blue a fin whale in orange, and this color scheme I'm using throughout, it's the same color scheme, a humpback whale in gray, and an Antarctic minke whale in red. And these colored brackets that I've now put up on the screen indicate what the previous estimates of prey consumption were and how our estimates differ. And what you'll notice is no matter what, there's always some variability and uncertainty. 
but our estimates are higher than past estimates. Show me which is the past, the square, the rectangle. Yeah, the past, the past estimates were like these brackets, basically. That two to five percent. Remember, we talked about that two to five percent per yeah. body weight per day. That that's these brackets here. And what's the left to right consumption per day? What's that mean? So this is basically just how much food you eat per day. And you can imagine yourself, right? Some days it's Thanksgiving and you eat a ton of food and other days you're you're not eating a lot of food. So the, the, the metric is tons per day, one through 50 tons per day. That's yeah. what the X is? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you're saying it used to be that you thought they were eating somewhere like one uh, to two tons per day. And in reality, they're eating five or more. Yep, exactly. Exactly right. And there's a lot of nuance around that. Uh, we can almost do a whole talk on that, but I won't. But in any case, you're right. Exactly right. I want to continue now because this is the stuff that I get really excited about. Not the whaling. This is a sad thing. But basically, what does all this consumption, what are our new estimates where we find out that whales eat more than we thought? What does that mean for ocean ecosystems and conservation? And Human beings did an amazing and terrifying experiment on the environment in the 20th century. So the amazing experiment that we did, and when I say amazing, I really mean, I don't mean impressive in terms of a, a positive thing. I mean, kind of horrifying, but amazing when you think about the, the scale of the impact, is we removed a large percentage of whales from the ocean, particularly from the Southern Ocean around Antarctica in the 20th century. From 1910 to 1970, we removed over a million large whales from the oceans around Antarctica. And just to give you an idea of how much biomass that is, how much body mass that is, that weight is equivalent to the weight of two to three billion people. And that's how many whales we exterminated just from the oceans around Antarctica in just 60 or 70 years in the middle of the last century. So not only did we do this incredible thing, but we also have incredible documentation of this extermination, which for the earlier whaling, like from the North Pacific or the North Atlantic, a lot of that started hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And so the extermination wasn't as quick and we don't have as good a documentation. Also, there were never as many whales in the Northern Oceans as there were in the Southern Oceans. So for many reasons, this was kind of the perfect experiment of what happens if you quickly and rapidly remove all the whales from an ecosystem, what happens to that ecosystem? That's what I was most interested in. The scale of the destruction of whaling is best exemplified by these two species in the Southern Ocean. These are blue whales on the left and fin whales on the right, the two largest species. And so if you orient yourself to this graph, which is a little confusing, but I'll walk you through it. So basically you have this blue line here is the population size, the total population size of blue whales in the Southern Ocean over time. And these red vertical bars are how many whales were killed per year. So in the blue, look at the scale on the left here. So this is in the hundreds of thousands of whales. So this would be at the beginning of the 20th century, there were over 300, whoop, over 300,000 blue whales in the Southern Ocean. And then by the end of the 1970s, there were less than 1,000. So these blue whales went from 350,000 animals to less than 1,000 animals in less than 70 years. That is a destruction or a removal of 99.8% of all blue whales in the Southern Ocean. In fin whales, a similar trend, you can actually see, um, and, and I should mention that these red bars are on a different scale, which is a bit confusing, but in any case, these red bars are in, uh, are, you should focus on the right scale here, which are the number of whale catches, how many whales killed per year. So in the 1920s and 1930s, we were killing anywhere between 10 and 30,000 blue whales each year. And just to orient you to how much killing that was, currently, Globally, blue whales all over the world, their population size is estimated to be about 20,000 animals. In the 1920s and 30s, that's how many we were killing each year. In the Southern Ocean, before whaling, there were over 300,000 blue whales. And on Earth, overall, there are about 400,000 blue whales. And now there are only 20,000. So we really did an excellent job at exterminating those animals. And fin whales, similar story in the Southern Ocean, except we hunted them later. So 
as you might imagine, humans wanted to extract the largest and therefore most valuable animals first. And so that's why the blue whales were first to go in the 20s and 30s. And then the fin whales, the major age of destruction in, for fin whales was the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. And you see this gap here in fin whales killed. Do you know what that is? What, war? World War? Yeah, exactly. We stopped killing whales so we could kill each other. <laughs> yeah. So right. but the, same, the same type of information on this graph here. These are actually numbers in hundreds of thousands. So fin whales in the Southern Ocean numbered over 600,000 um, mm -hmm. at the turn of the 20th century. And then by 1970, they numbered uh, less than 10,000, around 10,000. So we're talking about a destruction of around, of over 90% in a similar period of time. Um, and so this had- what was, the main, what was the main commercial purpose of, of killing oil of whales? Was it whale oil or what was it? Yeah, so that's, I'm glad you asked that question. So this is, I think, one of the saddest parts of the story is that we stopped using whale oil for light in the mid 1800s when we found out about kerosene. And then of course, at this time in the 1900s, we had incandescent lights. We had the lights that we know today. So what were we killing these whales for? It, it was pretty marginal products. Um, and that's, I think, what's the most sad about it is that we primarily, we killed them for margarine, oil to be put in cars, uh, fish meal to be fed to fish, fertilizers to be spread on crops and things of that nature. So nothing that we really needed. It's just that we, there was this there was this resource there and human beings at the time, it's like if there's a resource, we need to turn it into a market. We need to turn that into money and we can need to turn it into industrial extraction. And that's the scale, that's the story of humanity in the 19th and 20th centuries. I'm excited to be living in the 21st century where we're thinking now more about sustainability and recovery, but in any case, really kind of marginal products. You know, I had an interesting conversation with my mechanic, um, who's an older guy here in Monterey, and he said that in the 1960s, all the car oil um, switched over from a car oil that had whale oil in it to a car, to a car oil that, had, that is just purely synthetic now, as we know today, and as a result, apparently around that time, he had there was a lot of transmission issues or issues with like the car's mechanics because they were engineered to work well with whale oil. Um, and this was just an amazing thing to me. So like humans intimate history with whales is something that's just so, so interesting and so spectacular as you dig into these different components. But yes, if you were alive in the 1940s or 50s, you probably had whale oil in your car, um, which of course is just hard to imagine uh, something like that today. But this was really recent um, that this was occurring. And, that, and that's, I think, part of what's so interesting about this problem is that we exterminated these whales so efficiently and so recently that we can actually, that we documented what happened to the ecosystem after their destruction. And that's what we're gonna, that's what we're gonna go into. So um, let me show you what's going on here. So basically what this is doing is this graph here is taking our prey consumption estimates that we talked about earlier, right? So we took all that data that we, that we learned. So we say, okay, one blue whale we now know eats this much, one humpback whale, one fin whale, and so on. Um, and again, these colors are the same. So this is a blue whale in blue. This is a fin whale in orange. This is a humpback whale in gray. And this is a minke whale in red. And on the y-axis is the amount of krill that each of these populations ate per year. The top is how much current populations eat after whaling killed most of them. And the bottom is how much these whale populations ate before whaling. So what you see, and also worth noting, is on the, on the uh, x-axis here, uh, this is in a log scale. So what that means is that even small differences here are actually enormous differences. That's what a log scale does, it's like the Richter scale. Like if you go from a seven to an eight on the Richter scale, that's, an, that's a humongous difference in the strength of an earthquake. Same thing here. What you notice is because we killed all the whales or a vast majority of them, particularly of these blue and fin whales, what you see is that the total amount of krill that they ate declined precipitously, as you might imagine, there were just many, many less of them from the 1900s to the 2000s. Right now, what's interesting about this, however, is this vertical dashed line in this plot is how much krill there is in the entire Southern Ocean. And what this indicates, just doing a little ecological sleuthing, is that if you had 
historic populations of whales and modern populations of krill, it couldn't, it couldn't, it couldn't work. It wouldn't work. There wouldn't be enough krill in the ocean, basically. Whales would eat all the krill every single year. It wouldn't work, right? So what does that mean? Why is that important? Well, um, the reason why it matters is because scientists have been noticing these trends in the Southern Ocean for the past couple decades now, which is that we're seeing declines in primary and secondary productivity over the last several, uh, several decades in the Southern Ocean, where these whales are from. Most famously is this, this plot on the left from a nature paper in 2004. And what you see is when we were first able to take the first really scientifically robust estimates of how much krill were in the water around Antarctica, those numbers started to come around in the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s. And as you remember from a couple of slides before that I just showed, that's right when we finished killing almost all the whales, right? So we don't have data before them, but we have data after them. And I want you to notice something. See that? That's a really strong negative trend. So krill, the amount of krill in the oceans around Antarctica has declined precipitously in the last 50 years. And I should say this is not at all what was expected. What was expected by scientists in the 1970s was exactly the opposite, right? And you might imagine why this could be the case is because whales, which were by far the dominant predators of krill in the ocean, particularly in the Southern Ocean, if you remove all the krill predators, what would you expect to happen to the prey? More krill, you'd imagine. Exactly. More krill. But what did we observe? The exact opposite. As people stopped killing whales, somehow or another, the krill population shrank. Exactly. So is it possible that whales were actually maintaining their pastures of krill? Were the is krill it, eating the excrement of the whales? We'll get into this, but, but basically, yeah, you're asking good questions. And so how did this happen? Basically, the short answer is we believe that whales were farmers, um, not in the active sense in the way humans are, but whales and krill had this mutualistic relationship where they actually did better with both of them in the system than with either one of them removed. And to just orient yourself to how the globe and the oceans have changed in the last hundred years, in the blue line here, um, I've uh, aligned all the baleen whales in terms of biomass, in terms of total weight, um, from 1800 to 2000, and human, the mass of all humanity in the red line here. Wow, what a fascinating chart. So the red line is the weight of aggregate humanity, at any given year from 1800 to 2000. Yes. And the blue line is the weight of aggregate whales of certain kinds of whales or all whales? Just certain kinds, just, just these couple big ones that we've been talking about, just certain kinds, yep. So just those kinds of whales. You about six, whales. Yeah, this is just about like six species here make up this blue line. So really, yeah. what percent of all whales is that blue line? So I'd say that before 1800, this was probably, yeah, something like 80% of all whales, the biomass was in these couple species. But remember, right. there's, there's over 100 species of whales, something like 120 species of whales. And this blue line is only for the five biggest whales, basically. Right. Um, and yeah, so basically, point is that we removed a lot of biomass from the oceans um, in whales from right. really from 1900 to 2000, mostly. And at the same time, the human population on Earth was exploding. Right. Um, so we had this crossover point. And again, most people don't realize this. I mean, my great grandmother was alive when there were more whales by weight on the planet than people, right? This was not that long ago. Um, and, and we live in the moment, right? So people think that we and only we can affect and dominate the planet in this way, but there were more whales by weight on earth than people about a hundred years ago. So what's that 400 number translate to? What is that? Is that tons, billions? This is million metric tons. So that's about 400 million metric tons of people. Here's another thing that I wanted to, to, to do, a similar type plot, um, but of different data. So it's the same idea. You have uh, whales in the blue line and humans in the red line. And what you know, this, what this is, is this is the amount of seafood consumed, basically, per year as we started killing all the whales. So um, we, the humanity really only kept this data since 1950. This is from the Fisheries and Agriculture Organization data of the United Nations. But basically, um, 
you see that our consumption of seafood had increased starting in 1950 and increased up until about 1990. And when it's leveled off, we now get a lot more food um, from other sources, but we still are highly reliant on seafood as, as we know. But what's amazing here is that whales were able to eat more seafood and mostly in terms of krill. Uh, this is a krill uh, plot here, actually. So this is only krill. Um, so one, inch, one inch shrimp in lay terms. Yeah, basically, right, exactly. And just in the Southern Ocean, these whales were eating more seafood than all of humanity on Earth until about 1965. But the major difference, here's the major difference, is that as we know, global fisheries are in trouble. We are collapsing global fisheries. I mean, we're doing a better job now than we did 100 or 200 years ago fishing sustainably. But as you know, this rampant uh, fishing in ocean communities or ocean ecosystems uh, is collapsing global fish populations. There's lots and lots of information on this. However, when whales ate several times more than this, it was sustainable. So when there were more whales, somehow there were more productive oceans. And then, and what's the meaning of the red line going up and tapering across? Human well, that, well that, yeah, that's, yeah, that's human seafood consumption over time. Um, Why is it going down a little bit? Because we're switching more to uh, aquaculture and, and things of that nature. So we're switching more to, and, and uh, soy products and other things, um, different other types of food, partially because we're depleting ocean fish stocks so rapidly that we need to level off that line. Otherwise there'll be no more fish, le there'll be no more fish left basically. Um, so it's almost out of necessity more than uh, interest, let's say. So whales were able to somehow live in and we would argue maintain these really productive ecosystem states. And we think they did that by nutrient recycling. So basically by taking the nutrients locked up inside krill and fish bodies, digesting them and pooping them out all over the earth's oceans. And this led to more productive oceans than less productive oceans after we removed the whales. And this might seem like a, like a crazy concept, but if you think about it, all manure, all fertilizer ever used by humans on planet Earth before about the mid 20th century was some form of animal waste, some form of animal excrement. Only now recently can we create synthetic fertilizer in the last 70 years or so. And before that, every bit of fertilizer ever used on planet Earth was either bird guano or cow manure or something along those lines. This process operated similarly in the ocean with many more whales and many more fish as well, for that matter. So that's how we think there were more productive oceans in the past than there are today. Now, what we want to think about is how, if and how we can recover these giants in the ocean and recover those past more productive ecosystem states. If we look at how have whales recovered, we haven't hunted whales in an industrial sense for about 50 years. And so that is about two generation times worth of whales. So whale generation time is somewhere between 10 and 20 years. So in theory, we should be able to be seeing recovery. And in some species, we definitely are. This is humpback whales in the Southern Ocean. And for humpback whales, they are 93% recovered in the Southern Ocean after being 98% depleted by whaling. That's the key here, right? So humpback whales in most oceans are doing really well, not universally, but by and large. In contrast, blue whales are not recovering at a global sense, particularly in the Southern Ocean. So blue whales were depleted by 99.8% in the 20th century. And now these are some numbers um, that, uh, again, I think the actual specific numbers are not super important here. What is important is that even 50, 60 years since whales have been, since blue whales have been killed in the Southern Ocean, they've only recovered about 1%. Compare that to the slide before. Humpback whales recovered 93%. Blue whales have only recovered 1%. Why? Why indeed. That's now, now you're hitting on it, exactly. And fin whales, the same thing. They've also only recovered a small, small amount. Um, why? Well, we think the reason is, as I mentioned earlier, that these whales, particularly the larger whales that need more open ocean space, like off the continental shelf and things like that. So humpback whales are really 
generalist. They're really dynamic. They're able to use bays and inlets. They're able to eat fish and krill. They're able to basically exploit environments that the larger whales, blue whales and fin whales, can't exploit. So because humpback whales are really flexible in how they eat and what they eat and where they go, they've been able to recover really well in a human dominated world. But blue whales and fin whales, they really only do one thing in terms of their food. They just eat krill and they really, really are reliant on those krill populations uh, in really enormous swarms. And so one of the things we've noticed is that this is a paper that came out in 2004. And it predicted that blue whales, and this is data that they used data up until 1996. And what it showed was that blue whales should be recovering really swiftly in the coming decades. But we haven't seen that, as I showed you in the slide before. Blue whales have not, that recovery has stalled. And so why is that? That's been a mystery for the last couple of decades. And we think that the answer is food limitation. So in other words, before whaling, blue whales and fin whales, these two largest whales, ate about 100 million tons of krill per year, right? That's what we found in our recent paper that we published last month. However, the current total global population of those krill now is only 60 million tons in this area. So what does that mean? That means that these whales are food limited. It means that in the time of more whales, the ocean giants maintained their own pastures by recycling nutrients, in particular in the Southern Ocean, this means iron, because the micronutrient iron actually limits productivity of phytoplankton and then ultimately krill in the Southern Ocean. And whale poop is very, very rich in iron. And unlike the iron bound up inside krill bodies, when whales eat krill, they turn that krill into, into fertilizer, something that the phytoplankton can actually use. So I've been calling krill like mobile, uh, sorry, I've been calling whales mobile krill processing plants. So before whaling, you had a million of these large whales moving through the Southern Ocean, eating tons of krill and pooping out a ton, tons of fertilizer and then moving somewhere else and doing that. So you imagine each one of these whales is the size of a Boeing 737 in both weight and length. So it's a good sort of, I flew across the country in a Boeing 737 recently. There was a million of these in the Southern Ocean a hundred years ago, swimming around, eating, pooping, doing all their thing. And we think that they maintained their own pastures. In other words, whales are farmers, or perhaps more accurately, they're ranchers, maintaining their own pastures that their food feeds on. Whales have the ability to recover really swiftly. They can reproduce incredibly fast if the conditions are right. And what we're noticing now more than ever is that in the Southern Ocean where most of these whales were lost from and where we have the most potential to gain, there's just not enough food. There's not, the conditions are not good enough there for them to recover to anything close to their former numbers. So what do we do about this? And this is the call to action for not just, it's been my call to action for years and now I can um, you know, share it with you and you can let us know what you think and maybe even help if, you, if you're interested. But basically the current conundrum in the modern ocean is should we do something or should we do nothing? And when I say do nothing, I don't mean do nothing. I really mean, should we do something active or should we just do something passive, right? And so the do nothing is the, are these passive measures. So that includes marine protected areas, preservation of areas that haven't been destroyed. It includes carefully managing fisheries, in particular the krill fishery that the whales are highly reliant on. And it of course always will include maintaining and controlling climate change and the rapid change of Earth's ecosystems that we're seeing. These are all important to do. We all need to, we need to keep doing these, let me be clear. The question is, should we do these other things? Should we, in the case of the Southern Ocean fishery, should we reduce or eliminate krill fishing? Because humans actually hunt krill now, of course we do, in the Southern Ocean. Do we need to do that? I would argue no, um, but we could talk about that. Wait, you mean they're, they're hunting shrimp? How do, we, how do we fish krill? We do with big nets? Yep, giant trawls. Yep. Okay. yep, and we turn it into krill oil and fish meal. So if you go into your local, you know, Whole Foods or fancy, you're a marine, I'm sure you have some like bespoke pharmacy store there. <laughs> exactly. You'll find krill oil there. Okay. Just think about how ridiculous this is. Sorry, I'm on my soapbox now. Now, now, now you've got me. So now think about this. You can go to your local pharmacy 
in Mill Valley or wherever the closest one is and get krill oil. Now that krill has come from Antarctica. We send boats to Antarctica to fish out whale food that the whales need to bring it back here so that we could have a dietary supplement with our with our orange juice every morning. I mean, it's so ridiculous. Freshly squeezed orange juice, I presume. Well, you know, yeah, I mean, but this is just, it just drives me nuts. This thing drives me nuts. Do we need to do this? No, no, we don't need to do this, but we're doing it, right? And so should we reduce or eliminate krill fishing? I would argue yes. Obviously, people would argue the opposite with me. Okay, well, no, I'm, I'm just joined your bandwagon. Okay, next. Next. Should we think about actively restoring this ecosystem? In other words, should we consider really radical and grand proposals to try and fertilize and recover the krill populations of the Southern Ocean such that the whales can recover? And that might sound like a radical proposal to some, but we have done radical things uh, to recover environments in the last 50 or 100 years. We've reintroduced wolves to Yellowstone. We've reintroduced sea otters to the West Coast of North America. We've started to remove urchins from kelp forests to help kelp forests recover. We've, in some places, actually started, um, not, in, not in California, but in some places around the earth, we actually start fires. Actually, in California, we do this sometimes to control fire, but we start fires to help maintain grassland ecosystems. We're replanting trees. So ecosystem restoration is something that's not new. The question is, can we and should we and how do we do it on the open ocean? And that's a grand challenge. That's something we're thinking about right now. But I'll tell you, if there's any time to do it, now's the time. The humanity is primed, the earth is primed, and, and we all need this. You know, we need these ecosystems to recover, not just for the intrinsic benefits that we that we need on this planet, which is a planet with more wildlife, a planet with more natural environments, but also these whales provide tremendous benefits to, to humanity. So the whale watching industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. The carbon sequestration of whales is probably also multiple billions of dollars. We're actually doing analysis on this. What's that mean, the carbon sequestration of, of whales? So in other words, economists have put a value on the cost of carbon. So in other words, it's called the social cost of carbon. And economists somewhere put that value between something like 20 to $50, I think it is, per ton of carbon. It's probably far higher than that. But in any case, the cost to global human civilization of one emitted ton of carbon into the atmosphere is something like $50. Whales sequester in their bodies as they grow and then sink out to the deep sea as they die, but also through this fertilization benefit of fertilizing the seas, fertilizing phytoplankton, helping krill grow, that, that, that all draws carbon dioxide into those animals' bodies and sequesters it in there. That is a humongous resource to humanity and to planetary health that whales provide. So there are these vast, vast benefits to not just ocean ecosystems, but to planetary health for recovering whale populations. And as you might imagine, this is a grand challenge. This is something that we are trying to get funding now to, to at least experiment with, because you can't just do a grand restoration project. You first need to perform experiments to demonstrate that it'll be safe and effective, like anything else. However, doing these experiments is quite expensive. And so right now we're in the raising funds stage to, to try and get more data to assess how is the best way to perform these experiments. And yeah, so that's, that's, you know, that's my talk for today. Hopefully that's inspired some of you to think more about ocean conservation, the role of whales in ecosystems. And um, yeah, I mean, obviously I, I could spend an entire slide deck talking about all the people that we have to thank and all the funders we have to thank for the work that we've done up to this point. Um, and, but for now, uh, I'll, leave it, I'll leave it there. My contact information is right up here. Uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch. I love chatting with people about this stuff. Um, it's a great joy for me and a great, uh, a great opportunity to be able to get to work on these things and talk with you all. So thanks again, Ron, for having me. And uh, yeah, I hope we can chat more maybe do a whale watch, maybe do a little tour of the Marine Station. Um, it would be fun to interact with your group, for sure. So people who want to support your cause, Matt, they basically send emails to msavoka13 at gmail.com. And yeah. is there a web page also for where you keep people posted on what your activities are? I can actually just show it to you. It's your name, Matthew Savoka Ecology. 
www.weebly.com. But again, um, the best way is to, is to I, would, I would honestly say, send me an email or follow me on Twitter if anyone is on Twitter. Okay. Um, and then of course, yes, you can definitely look at my website here. I definitely have a number of things. I have the, the papers we've been publishing and some of the press coverage of those works. This is that recent paper that we spoke about today. Um, and then for example, I keep a little blog where I write about some of the things that um, that excite me or trouble me. Um, uh, so for example, we I just recently wrote a post about um, the National Academies came up with a thing about uh, what we should do about ocean plastic pollution, which does threaten whales as well. And so I wrote a little ditty about um, about the ocean plastic pollution problem and the National Academies report on it and things of that nature. So yeah, I mean, you know, that 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 definitely be the, the way to go, I think, Ron, is to send me an email or follow me on Twitter. Matt, you're doing God's work. Thank you very much uh, for your efforts to save the planet. You're welcome to come up to the Yacht Club and meet more folks. Yeah. Uh, we in the aquatic world, yachtsmen, et cetera, want to do what we can to preserve the oceans and keep them clean. And uh, many of us are green recreating. Our uh, Big Boat series is uh, decreasing the amount of plastic bottles that get used at each regatta. We believe that it's in our interest and everyone's interest that we take care of this incredible ecosystem that we live in. No, I mean, I, I, that, that's really important um, to me. I'm super happy to be working with, you know, and talking to groups like yours that, that treat that really seriously, you know, cause, cause we all benefit and we all enjoy this, this ecosystem and we need to take care of it. And so um, I really appreciate all those comments that you just made. It, it's not trivial to me because a lot of people use these, use these things and don't actually treat them with respect. And it's, that's quite troubling to me. And, and we can't live on a planet like that anymore. We've done it for centuries, and now the planet is saying, you know what, enough is enough. Thank you very much, Matt Svoke. It's been great having you as a guest on the Wednesday Yachting Lunch. With that, we adjourn the lunch. Thanks so much, Ron.